Well, hello, and it's very exciting to be with you. Uh, we're live and from the Oxford Centre for Fantasy, and we're going to be talking today about the Second Age and the Amazon Prime series that's based on that material due to be broadcast next year. Uh, many of you will be watching this on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, but there's also a podcast version of this, um, which if you want to listen to, you can find it on our website at the Myth Makers Podcast. Right, well, let me introduce the people who are joining me today for this discussion. So first of all, Paula, over to you. Hi, I'm Paula Calamaris. Um, I'm a fantasy writer and I own a small publishing company. And I've just released a new fantasy novel with my partner, um, Paul Crayley, called Shadows and Light. And I've been influenced by Tolkien for as long as I can remember. And also with us is Ty, who has, I think, the most uh, Tolkien-esque name I've ever come across. So, Ty, tell us a little bit about yourself. I do production as well as distribution internationally and uh, been a Tolkien fan for my life, pretty much. So looking forward to discussing this stuff. That's uh, as a movie maker or a filmmaker, as we say over here in uh, Oxford. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, and I'm Julia Golding. I'm the director of the Oxford Centre for Fantasy, but I'm also a novelist and a screenwriter, amongst other things. And really, Tolkien was the writer who got me into writing when I was younger. So uh, like Paula and like Ty, absolutely fascinated to see what happens, what happens um, when so the Second Age material is taken on for this series. So what we're going to be doing, first of all, is giving you a rough guide to where you can find the material. That's the sources in which you can look up later for the detail. Then we're going to be drawing out the main themes that are available to the screenwriters. And then we're going to have fun working out what they might do with that material, both the challenges and also the riches that they have to uncover. So first of all, let's talk about the sources for the Second Age. Uh, so first of all, Paula, where would you go to first if you are looking for Second Age material? Well, the first place that I always look is in, are in the appendices of uh, the Return of the King, because that gives the story of Arwen and it gives us and Aragorn and it gives us the, the timelines of all of the ages, the rise and fall of Numenor. You find out everything else, and then I go to the Silmarillion. So those are my okay, three major so points. So, Ty, where would you go in the Silmarillion? I know that you're a particularly expert on this because the first thing you told me about yourself was that your introduction to Tolkien was by which book? Silmarillion, yeah. yeah. And oh. um, it, it started with The Hobbit, actually, with my mom reading The Hobbit to us when we were kids and then went to uh, – I hadn't read Lord of the Rings. I actually started with The Silmarillion. <laughs> and um, – that was really interesting because it's probably the toughest book to start to read because you got to keep flip, flipping back and forth to the end and trying to figure out who these guys are. But the final part of that book is A Calibeth, which was written by, pretty much brought together by Christopher um, after, after Tolkien passed away. And uh, it's where I get pretty much all my information. It describes the lands, who they were, and what finally happened to them. So... Uh yeah, and Christopher Tolkien is obviously the the son of Tolkien, who who died very recently, but he took on the editorial task once his father had passed. Mm -hmm. And the final place where, well, I mean, there are probably other places too, but the final sort of main chunks that you can find are ones which are a bit more obscure. They're in um, a volume called The Unfinished Tales, which, as the title tells you, they are unfinished. They're also sometimes not the final version in the sense that you might find the same story told slightly differently in, say, the Silmarillion. So they're not like the canonical version, <laughs> the last version uh, of Second Age material. But that's also got some really fascinating little stories in there um, and some longer length tales if you want to look them up. Okay, so that's the main sources. Let's think about the main storylines that you get running through the Second Age. Now, just so you can sort of position yourself, um, if you're not familiar with Tolkien material, uh, he divided his world up into four ages. You've got the First Age, which are the sort of creation story and the early days of the elves. 
And the big battles there are the Silmarillion. You've got the Second Age, which we're talking about. The Third Age is a very long period, but the end of that is very familiar from The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And then the Fourth Age is uh, what happens after, plot spoiler, <laughs> the ring is destroyed. I think everybody knows that who's watching this so. podcast. <laughs> yeah, hope so. Um, anyway, so... Ty, would you tell us what the main storyline in the Numenorean case is, just in brief? Yeah, so what happened after the elves battled effectively Satan, which was Morgoth or Melkor, was that the, uh, the Valar, which were the gods, took pity on man. And so they decided to give them a place away from their tr trials and troubles and all that, and it was called Numenor. And it's a fascinating story because it's it's equivalent equivalent to like heaven, you know. It's there's no sickness, long life, but ultimately you do die. But it was the gift of death that was granted to them by God, Iluvatar. And so it starts out as being this amazing place of bliss, and it just the story unfolds and it starts getting more interesting as we go along, and we'll get into that later. Exactly. Uh, and that's yeah. all in the Akalabeth, which you mentioned from... Correct. Yeah. Somewhere in. Uh, oh. Paula, there's some really important themes happening over on the sort of more familiar territory of Middle-earth, isn't there? There sure are. Um, simultaneous to what's going on in Numenor, you have men, it's many Numenorians and other men over here, and they're mingling with the elves. And the elves are mingling, um, they're fighting against Sauron, who uh, has taken over from Satan or Melkor. And he's, um, he's created a very tense world and the elves keep fighting against him, but other elves keep leaving. They go to, um, they leave the, the main kingdoms of Lindon and some of the other um, places. And they go to a place, they start a place called Erigion. And if you know what Erigion is, it's also something called Holland, which is um, during the Fellowship of the Ring becomes a place that's um, dangerous to the Fellowship as they go through, which forces them to go into the mountains, which ultimately forces them to go to some place called Moria. And when they get to Moria, they meet all sorts of dangers. Well, during the Second Age, the dangers are introduced by the dwarves who keep dwell delving down into the mines of Moria and they wake up something called the Balrog or Durin's Brain. Durin's, I can say this, Durin's Bane. And the Balrogs are, are um, perverted Maya. So everything that uh, will ultimately become Gandalf or Saruman or the others or Melian, who is in the Hidden Kingdom, the Maya are one step down from the Valar, and they're here in Middle Earth to, you know, help. But the Balrogs have been perverted by uh, Morgoth and have become evil, and will play a more important part in in the Fellowship of the Ring and the transcendence of of Gandalf. But at this time, the elves are moving. Our elves are moving into Erigion and. There's a, an elf named Celebrimbor, and Celebrimbor or Celebrimbor is um, the son of one, or the grandson of one of the great um, jewel makers or artificers who, from the first age named Feanor, who created these special jewels. And Ty, if you want to add in about Feanor from the Akalabeth, go right ahead. I'm just enjoying your, your talk. Okay. Um, Feanor created these jewels. They created a lot of hassle for everybody. They're all lost. People died all over the place. And Celebrimbor fought against his father, who was going after the Silmarils, and became a great jewel maker of himself. Well, after they defeat Sauron, he tricks them. He takes on a beautiful form. He calls himself Anatar. And oh, sorry. He, um, he comes and he teaches them how to make these rings of power. And these rings of power are the same rings that have, have been, that, that are very important in the third age. Well, um, there's a whole poem about, you know, rings of power, nine went to the mortal men, seven went to the dwarves and three went to the elves. 
Well, Sela Brimbor, Sauron touched all of the rings except the ones for the elves. And then he created the one ring, which is the whole crux of the third age and the fellowship of the ring is he creates this one ring that rules all these other rings so he can hand out rings and they seem to work for a while and they're very nice and they're very pleasant and everybody's rich and they have long lives and they have all these things and then eventually greed and cruelty and all of the other things that characterize Sauron come to play and the men turn into what are eventually called the Nazgul and the dwarves lock themselves up and keep digging for more and more treasure and the elves hide the rings. So Sauron never has, even though his one ring can control them, he's never touched them. So that's where, that's the secondary line of stories that's going to be going on. If you've got Numenor over here and you've got the rings being created over there, eventually they're going to come together. Okay, so my role in this, yeah. Yeah, my role in this is to kind of um, do the rest. Um, so you've got the forging of the rings, the making of the rings, Sauron as the tempter figure um, happening in Middle Earth. But around Middle Earth, you also have the potential for story themes of characters that we know exist at that time. Uh, I'm sure anyone who's read the books can come up with quite a few. Uh, obviously, you've got Treebeard and the Ents are still rocking around at this time. Um, and you've got Tom Bombadil. Um, he, he's the oldest, so he's definitely there. And what about the others? Well, we know from the very start of Lord of the Rings, I don't know when you pick up Fellowship of the Ring, if you go straight into the story or if you read those introductory elements, but there is a little hob Hobbit history uh, and you've got sort of like not exactly primitive, but early communities of hobbits. Um, he mentioned three families who are, who are like prototype hobbits. They don't seem to take much part in history, but they are, you know, potentially there. And one thing which I'm really fascinated about is in the unfinished tales. Um, there's mention of I've got to get there. Names right because it's very similar to another name, the Druidine, as opposed to the Druidin. They are the wild men, um, and if you remember in the Return of the King, when Rohan is looking for a way, th a quick way through to Minas Tirith to join the Battle of Pelennor, they go through a forest and they met, they meet this wild man. So it's a kind of um, species of man, a bit similar to say like the Aboriginal communities in. Um, Australia. It's that kind of relationship to the other men around them. And there's a really fascinating series of tales about these men uh, in the unfinished tales, including the tantalizing glimpse of the fact that some of them are on Numenor. They are there because they love um, the one tree that's there. Um, and I think that would be just fascinating. They also have that perspective that they're slightly outside the main run of men. Um, so if you're looking for a, another perspective on this story, they are potential. Um, and in addition to them, you've also got other men, <laughs> not Numenorians, but just general, general run of the mill men um, and women. Um, and there is a story about Numenor coming in as like, a, first of all, a friendly power, bringing um, crafts and agriculture, and then as a colonial oppressor, as the Numenor sort of sours. So you've got another potential colonial story there, which um, exists. So anyway, these are some of the themes which we've drawn out that cover the Second Age material. We should mention, of course, that it's a hugely long period of time, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, is it about 4,000 years? Something like that, isn't about it? About 4,000 years, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a long period of time. So Very when you long. think about our own history, 4,000 years ago, we're talking uh, Egyptians, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's that period of time. There's a lot of potential of um, uh, difficult to write. as a. But fortunately, you've got characters who live that long. When you talk about elven characters, for example, and Ents, they, they obviously have long lives. Okay, so... 
Let's we talk about how the themes interact. I've mentioned one way, which is the Numenorean, um, uh, the idea of them as co- colonizers coming over and reacting with Middle Earth. But there are other links. It's not as if the creation of the rings happens over here and Numenor over here. There's lots of triangulation that goes on. Where do you see the main connections to make the story of the Second Age basically hold together? Paula, why don't you, you have start? A... Oh, I was waiting Paula, for you. Paula. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. I, you know, the, the interesting thing is you've got Elrond and Elros. You know, one's half elven, the other one chooses the human side. You know, that, that was one of their their offers, which, you know, they uh, they took upon themselves. One of them said, okay, I'll take the houses of the elves. That was Elrond, and that's why you see him through all the ages. The other one was Elros, who was gifted as king Numenor. And so, you know, there's there's this, you never find out in any of Tolkien's writings whether or not they got to talk to each other. It was far before the Palantir, so some somebody wrote, oh, they would have looked at each other, and they're like, eh, back up, guys. They didn't have that. So I think if you followed that narrative, where you've got two brothers that are effectively in different parts of the world. Remember, Rivendell was set up as a refuge. So there was still war. There was still bad stuff going on in Middle Earth. They, they still had Sauron. Whereas in Numenor, it was long life, no sickness. You're close to the Blessed Realm. You've got, uh, you know, Aule built it up so it would have been beautiful. Ivana, who was one of the Maiar, I mean, uh, she was one of the Valar, blessed it. So it really was, in all aspects, a perfect place. And when the Numenorians went over, it's about 600, eight, eight, oh, 600, whatever, second age year. Everybody was amazed at their power. And so what does that say about Middle Earth at the time? It was kind of a dark ages. And so it will be very interesting to me how the writers and the producers will put those two together. Because, again, it's a long, long period, you know, 4,000 years and God knows how many characters, it's going to be interesting to see what point of time they're going to address. And to your point, you know, you've got Galadriel that's been around. You've got mm. oh, you've yeah. got pretty much all of the elves are still going to be there that we know in, in Lord of the Rings, including Glorfindel. Um, so to me, that's going to be the fascinating part is how do they put these two together? And how do they show, to your point, The Numenorians originally as gift givers, you know, hey, we want to help you out. We want to build a city. We want to be here for you and and protect you to becoming that power where even Sauron's armies leave and Sauron has to, hey, you know, don't wipe me out, kids. I'm here. And they put, you know, like you said, they put the the Middle Earth men or, or the middle men in servitude. And that will be really interesting to see how they how they present that. Because you had two groups of people on Numenor. You had those who were adamantly for that, let's go oppress them. And then you had a group called the Faithful, which was totally against that. They were more, let's follow Elivatar or God, let's treat everybody right. And it's going to be fun to watch how they address that. And I also think there's going to be a, a, yeah. a, a significant amount Definitely. with the elves, because the elves were... No matter what, the Numenorians were still jealous of the elves. I mean, these are oh, these absolutely. guys are immortal, and they've got Maya or Mayar in there, um, you know, breeding with them. So that you know, what by the time you get to um, down to Arwen, she's got great great grandparents who are you know Mayar, which are one step down from the Valar, and you've got and you know all of the elven ancestry. So you have all of that going on. You have a king like Gilgalad, who's, he's keeping himself to himself, even though he's out trying to protect people. Well, this still causes a great deal of stress amongst all of these people, because you get, you know, you've had the story of Luthien and Baron, and they've captured a Silmaril, and she's given up her um, elven existence. And that rankles with people a lot, especially with the elves, because their immortality means that they will eventually, even if after they die, their spirits will go to um, to Valar and they will be there with the gods. Whereas the um, 
mortal men will go to the halls of Mandros and have a completely different fate. And men aren't really excited about that concept. I mean, you know, it's like they're going to die and these guys get the, you know, they go hang out with the gods and it's, it's a little, you know, there's, there's a certain tension that exists probably at all times. I mean, it goes yeah, all the way the, down there. Yeah. I think Gil Gallard is an interesting new character. Um, he does get mentioned in a song in uh, Lord of the Rings. I think Sam sings the song. Yeah, Sam sings the song, which is a good summary of the Gil Gallard um, story. But he is the big, exciting new character on the elf side who has a kingdom, um, which I'm sounds very much like my favorite chocolate brand but linden <laughs> and that is if you look at the maps it's sort of above where you normally look for the shire and it's a kingdom that's both land and sea so in terms of um the potential for the filmmakers they've got some new landscapes they can explore because they have not really done much about the sea and because he is a, in a seafaring kingdom, uh, that gives them a connection to the Numenorians, And he is actually friendly with one very important king from Numenor. Um, and that friendship means that the Numenorian fleet comes at the right time to save their bacon at some point. So he's a key character, and I'm sure is um, because he lives through the whole period, uh, will be one of the uniting sort of threads because compared to them, all the men are like mayflies. They, they live for such a short time. Uh, they come and go. Whereas the elf characters are that sort of thread of continuity. So I think that when we sort of thinking about the challenges, and gosh, there are lots of challenges <laughs> for these screenwriters. Um, what do you think of the main challenges? Um We've already mentioned the long spans of time um, and how you make that connect. Um, what else do you see as challenges for them? David, um, I think just the the scope of the story. Now they they said they're going to do multiple series, so it mm. may be that you know they start with something year one. Remember in Lord of the Rings, the thing that uh, Peter Jackson did was he would start it with kind of a summary about how everything came to be. Um, my guess is they're going to look, I, I don't think they're going to do a deep dive into everything. I think Tolkien yeah. fans will probably be a little bit bummed out because they're not getting into the deep lore. But again, if you get into the deep lore, you're going to lose a, a huge part of your audience because somebody's going to be saying, I'll go back to Ted Lasso, you know? Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's figuring out, again, who those central characters are. And I, I would agree with you guys. I think they're probably going to go elvish and um, because they've been around and they can tell stories about, you know, this is how this happened. Because remember, well, I'll bring it up. Um, Akalabeth was originally written as a letter. So it was to somebody from somebody. And it was about this is how the downfall of men happened on Numenor. So you know, it'll be interesting to see if they take it from a, a linear, a straight point here, we're going to start and here we're going to end like Lord of the Rings, or if they're going to go back and forth between things to show past history and how this affected this. So, you know, Al Farazon and his, you know, he was the last king and he was the one that challenged the West and said, I'm going to go. And it'll be interesting to see if they start with that because that'll be a massive, massive, massive piece. And you're going to wonder what the heck is this all about? So it's going to be fun. Um, I, I could not imagine being in a writer's room and, uh, and also be under the restrictions or the guidance and the restrictions of, you know, the Tolkien family, because you got to think of it. They're going to, they, they already said they're going to inv invent new characters that kind of go along with the story but they are not allowed to go outside of the storyline. So they've got to stick to it. So to me, it's going to be so interesting to see how they, they keep that going. Because I think, you know, in the, the Lord of the Rings, there were a few things in there that I think a lot of uh, diehard Tolkien fans, you know, they loved it, but some of the things they weren't too happy about. And uh, 
to me, it's going to be interesting to see who they aim for. Are they aiming for the Tolkien fan or are they aiming for the larger audience? And I think they're going to go larger audience. I agree. I definitely agree that they're going to go larger audience, but I think they're also going to fill in with the obsession that everybody has with elves. I mean, if you even if you look at something like Pinterest or some of these other sites, um, because I, I teach a Tolkien class. And um, so I like to do PowerPoints for people so that they can see things. And you just look for images and there's like thousands of in images of elves in various situations, not necessarily connected to Tolkien, but they're elves and they're based on, you know, Thranduil and Legolas and all of them. And it's very interesting to see this, even when some of these like Tolkien wikis and all of these other places. So I think they're going to have to take into consideration that there is a huge section of the population that are diehard Tolkien fans, whether it was through the movies or, or whatever, you know, the Hobbit, which my mom read to me and, you know, my, I, I graduated from Lewis to being handed the Hobbit to being, to reading Lord of the Rings. I mean, that, that was a progression of my, my reading as a child. And then she wondered why I was a medieval history major. Progression. But, um, but so I really think that at this point, they're going to have to integrate both of them. And I, I was saying to Julia, I thought one of their best ways would be to doing it is just as Galadriel tells the story at the beginning of the fellowship of the rings, maybe Elrond's telling this story and he's telling it to Aragorn as Estelle, as a young boy, he's telling him his history without revealing that he is to be the king someday. And I thought that would be an interesting device to use. Go ahead. I'm just going to say another little sidebar, as you mentioned Thranduil, who's Legolas's um, father, that he's around, just another he's person. Around. Yeah. Um, I think that, the problem they have, though, is just the realities of making – let's think about it now as creatives as opposed to Tolkien nerds, uh, difficult yep. though that may be. Um, we So the films were made for a theatrical audience, um, family audience. What we already know from the gossip coming out of um, New Zealand, they hired an intimacy um, coordinator, which is a sign that there will be some, um, well, it could be a, a, a person on person violence, but it often is a sign there's sexual um, interactions going on for which they fortunately now have proper, you know, coaching for. But it does suggest adult themes. And I think there's a concern, um, which I've heard on the sort of discussion uh, when we posted we were doing this lots of people saying, please don't do a Game of Thrones. They don't want that. The issue is that there is loads of potential for that, in particularly in the Numenorean materials, because you've got human sacrifice, forced marriages, which are basically marriage by rape by marriage, all sorts of um, corrupt sh shenanigans. Um so you can see how legitimately sticking within the story um, that they have been allowed to use, that they could go in that direction. I think it would be a massive mistake to take it too mature. I just think um, it would, if it's not something you can sit down with your or maybe teenage kids and, and watch comfortably, I think that would be really hard and for I me, think that it can would be, be a alluded failure. to without being graphic. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, in terms of sort of rankings in um, you know film rankings, I think it if it go it's a different in America to over here, but we would say um, an advisory level or a fifteen is how we do it here. And what's the Gene, absolutely 15? Um, if they go above that to the sort of 18, over eighteen thing? I think that. They'd lose an audience. I, I think there would be a massive lot of unhappy <laughs> Tolkien fans out there, but maybe that's, I don't know. What do you think about this that? Is, well, and this is why, you know, we didn't even talk about who another point of view where it would come from would be through Sauron, yeah, through Anatar, because he is the underlying factor here. After, after Morgoth or Melkor falls, um, you know, he's left. He's still in Middle-earth. And so he's building 
stuff. And when he sees the uh, the Numenorians, he's like, okay, I got to build Mordor. So, and then he comes back as Anatar, you know, the gift giver. And he look he he was apparently a pretty good looking good looking guy because the elves welcomed him in and said, hey, yeah, come on in. So for me, you know, I don't think. I don't feel like they're going to go Game of Thrones because first of all, Game of Thrones has already been done. The audience is there and they don't want that comparison. The other side of it is don't forget uh, the Tolkien estate is behind this. They have the ultimate say in what goes in and what doesn't go in. I think that they would be, uh, I can't speak on their behalf, but if I was thinking about it and thinking the way Tolkien perceived the books, which was you look at the Hobbit, very kid story, harmless fun. Then you go into the Lord of the Rings, which was much more, okay, this is the establishment of the age of men and you're going in. The Silmarillion is the darkest of all of them because it's almost a narrative. It is a narrative and it is, it is as dark as you're going to get From the because beginning. you've got, yeah, you've got the gods going against this. You got, you know, fighting against each other. And you also have thing, something that I find interesting, which is that it's almost as if once the Valar have done their part, they leave and they leave it up to man to take care of. So for me, the second age is going to be about, you know, the establishment of the kingdom of men, but also what's still happening in Middle Earth. And you can't tell that story without being pretty dark in some places because that's what it's all about. So, you know, we discussed this earlier about, will there be humor? And, um, you know, if I'm guessing, and I, this is all I am doing is guessing, there's probably not going to be a lot of humor in this. It's going to be a epic story with, I mean, you talk about visuals, some of the stuff I can't wait to see, you know, the Great Mountain, you know, basically just going through all of Middle Earth during that time too. So, um, yeah, I, my guess is it's going to be around 15 or what we call PG-13 here, maybe between that and R in some places. Yeah. But, you know, going full on that way, you're going to lose a lot of Tolkien fans. They're going to be going, eh, not for me. I'll read the books. Well, maybe not just Tolkien fans. People will be looking for um, family entertainment. The, the, the people who True. went to see the films aren't necessarily Tolkien fans. They just think, oh, here's a good fantasy film. And I think if they turn up and find it's the kind of thing where you want to cover the eyes of your... Actually, in, in my family, the kids would be embarrassed that I was there, they'd be covering my totally. eyes. Mom, you can't watch this. Um, I think if that's the reaction, it, it it's going to be, it will certainly restrict people who watch it, I think. Whether or not it finds a new audience, that could be the calculation. Uh, I can imagine that conversation going on. We need to actually expand yeah. this into a, a new audience. And again, Maybe. it's not going to be broadcast. It's going to be specific. So unless you stream it and you don't and you don't have that service, you're not going to really, you're not going to really see yeah. it. And I think that's yeah, an but interesting I'm way because that may open them up to doing all sorts of things that I think might be excessive. But then there are, I mean, just remembering what happened to Kel Brimbor, what Sauron does to him at the end. You all remember that. He's yeah, so him, the plenty of torture potential. So that kind of thing, I mean, but that's part of the story. That's part of what, how the evil manifests. And a lot of this is about evil manifesting. It's but I just manifesting want to go back to something. I just want to go back go to something Ty said, which was about the linking figure of Sauron. Now, as a creative, uh, that's what I would probably be thinking about most because you have, I don't think they'll do this, but you have the wonderful potential for an anti-hero, the kind of Miltonic Satan figure. You could almost see a really surprising take on this to be telling it from his point of view because he is the guy who keeps getting knocked down and gets back up again, um, the Lucifer figure. They won't do that, of course, but you could see a really fascinating version of this telling it from that flip side it would be because an interesting it, it would be an interesting device to, to yeah. have him as part of the narrative maybe not because if you it, think but... of the the you know the season conclusions let's say they're doing four or five seasons 
you've got his downfall is really there at each one of those or his rise um, back into power. He is the guy who is actually the, the point at which we get this climax. He is the reason why Numenor is, um, you know, turns into Atlantis and disappears. He is the reason why the rings are created, you know. So he is absolutely key, central. And another thing that um, Ty mentioned is the lack of we th- potential for the lack of charm and humour. Now, this is where I want to throw my toys out of the pram because I think the real difference of um, Tolkien from many other forms of fantasy is that he has this real, dare I say, English sensibility. Um, you know, the hobbits having tea and talking about second breakfast. There's a sort of earthiness and grounding in there, a charm, which is harder to find in the Silmarillion, but not impossible to find. And if they don't do that, it will just feel like yet another big scale fantasy epic thing, which never actually touches the heart. Um, And I think that's the danger because the elves aren't us. Who is the perspective that is us? Uh, I don't emote with... Uh, with an eternal being um come to aware of my frailty and hum- humanity and you can obviously have human perspectives in it particularly so any underdog figures like the elf friends the Numenorean elf friends um who are the ones who fall out of favor with the kings as they get more and more corrupt I think them. one of the other ways of having charm is when you think back to the beginning of the Silmarillion and how the world is created, Ilavatar introduces music. And music is very mm-hmm. much a part of Elvish tradition and Elvish life, and I'm sure with the Numenorians. And I think if they play upon the music and play upon the poetry and the songs, that could add um, a lot of charm. Even with some, I think it would. Well, you see, I think that will add atmosphere and but, and beauty. But would it actually, by charm, I mean, but if, something a bit more relatable? Well, I think um, if you're performing it and you're on stage, with, you know, if you're a performer who's a human doing it for an elf, as or as Sam would do a poem or any other thing, you can introduce somebody with a sense of humor or with something more wry than just the grim, um, okay, we're going to colonize and destroy everyone concept. We can, you know, maybe make. But but, but don't you think they need banter? So I'm just thinking like, might, I'm yeah, a super cute, you know, what they need is like the fellowship had banter. Um, yeah. And when you think of the success of the Marvel films, the ones that often do the best are the ones where there is banter, even though these are superhuman characters, uh, when there's humor, like the Thor Ragnarok, everybody goes, wow, this is really funny. And suddenly I can relate to the fact that Thor's a god because he's talking about um, the Hulk being a friend from work. You know, suddenly it becomes, oh, yeah, I can relate to them. I think you, you don't want everyone sort of speaking at the verily, my Lord, I deem that thou art this, that stuff. You want something that's much more... Uh, I, I would almost imagine that Elros has a better sense of humor than Elrond. Yeah. Well, and I was going to yeah, get to right. that. So Elrond does have that sense of humor when, you know, Merry and Pippin are going to go. He's like, well, I guess you're going to go. <laughs> and then, you know, there is that underlying humor. And, and I think it is very much the English humor, um, which is the, oh, you know, it's great that you're in this meeting, even though you weren't invited. Um, so I, I think... My guess is they're they're going to find these characters that they can put in there that, you know, provide a little bit of levity because you have to. I mean, you just can't have oppression, you know, through six seasons of, uh, you know, that's going to be tough. So I think finding that underlying, you know, with tragedy, it allows humor to be all that greater, that much greater. And that's where, you know, that's what some of the best movies that have been out there. I mean, Shawshank Redemption. Guy's going through hell, but he still talks a little bit to Red. Why is your name Red? I'm Irish. You know, it's that kind of that kind of underlying humor where it can be subtle. You know, we're not going to go you know, full on whatever the office, but uh, although they did do a good Tolkien office, I will I will say that. Um, but if you did something like that, where you know you've got peaks and valleys, you've got 
those parts where there's a little bit of humor, a little bit of touch in there. So you're giving people that, but you also have the hope element that's going to play huge in the story. Um, you know, it's fighting evil. There's, that's one of the things I love about it. There's definitive evil and then there's this good and then there's the middle. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they take that narrative. I agree. I also sure think that when way. you have relationships and you're going to be having relationships between, you know, elven men and or human men and elven women and other things, that they're not going to just be grim sitting around doing nothing. I mean, they're going to. And I'm not talking yeah. intimacy. I'm just talking about getting to know each other and banter. And, you know, I would imagine that, you know, the. There had to be something more than, oh, I just saw her standing there and I fell in love with her. They probably had to talk at some point. So they, I'm sure that will bring some kind of um, human touch to some of these. I mean, that's something else to mention is that actually in the Second Age, there is loads of women. Yes. Um, you've got some really interesting Numenorean women. There's um, in Three the... Queens. In the Unfinished Tales, there's um, a really interesting story of um, a king and his wife, a sort of failed marriage. It's a long study of a failed marriage of one of the Numenorean kings where um, he's going off sailing the world, making friendship with Gil Gilgalad and others, which turns out to be key. But from the perspective of the wife left behind, it's kind of like, hey, <laughs> you know, where's my husband gone? Where you are know? you going? Yeah. Um, you come back? And it's, back to Middle Earth. <laughs> It's very interestingly written and very nuanced. Um, you could have a whole season yeah. of just that. Actually, I don't think I'd do that. But you, could. Um, you could. And you've obviously got Galadriel in a key position. Um, one of the questions we were sent in is um, by uh, who, who asked this? Let me just find. Elizabeth was asking us, what about dwarf women? Because one of the key centers is Moria, as you mentioned. And in the films, um, you'll remember that there's a reference, brief reference to dwarven women. Uh, and in fact, in The Hobbit, uh, Peter Jackson puts them in, the bearded ladies. Hmm. But there are, you could do a proper dwarf kingdom where you see proper strong dwarf women um, as well. That would be quite fun. Right. No, they're cave bodies, but it doesn't mean that they, you know, don't have influence on what goes on. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I, I look. The great thing about Tolkien is he made the women, you know, very strong, and you got that from his Norse influence, I think, and and also just he wanted that feeling that you know you're going to have somebody that's not going to just be oh poor little me, and you know, it's it's amazing how like with Numenor we were talking about. There's three queens, and they were very powerful. One actually relinquished the throne because it was going to be overthrown anyway, and. I look at that and between that and Sauron, and again, you've got Galadriel still out there. You've got, um, you've got quite a few characters that you can start picking on, including which would be interesting is we talked about, uh, you know, the eldest Tom Bombadil. Well, he's got a hell of a sense of humor. So, uh, you know, maybe it's him and, and Goldberry, you know, <laughs> dealing with that too. I, I don't know. It's going to be fun. I would they, love I'm not going to go off on that tangent. That. I missed him so much in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but I really wanted bit, him there. Yeah. He, the problem is, as a as a from a story point of view, is he kind of busts through things. He doesn't he doesn't behave. You know, he's he's a bit of a, a, a random element, almost a caricature in a sense. He'd be really hard to make convincing. Uh, he, you know, basically, I think he works on the page and would be hard to work in a a film personally. So yeah. Um, we've got some I more questions here. Are you ready there. for the, the questions? Are you ready for the questions? So um, Parker asks, do we think that the show is going to be similar in tone to the Peter Jackson movies? I don't. You don't. I mean, we've already mentioned the adult themes. I've got a feeling the look is going to be a bit similar. The actual um, design oh, of it. The, the, one, the one image that we've got uh, that's on the, if you go to the, Amazon Prime site for it, the banner image. If you look very carefully, um, you can see the white tree of Nimloth in the back. I don't know if anyone's noticed that. Um, this is, it looks like a sunrise, but if you look carefully, you can see branches. So it looks as though it could be um, Numenor, uh, that that is a still from, if that is 
indeed a tree, but the it feels like a potential production design from the Peter Jackson films, I think, with that unreal, not quite rooted landscape of um, Mediterranean on jacked up on some drug uh, style places with lots of white arches and that kind of thing. Um, so I think the, the tone also... is going to be similar in look as opposed to material, you know, script. I think you're right. I, I think, and when I said, do I think it will be like the Peter Jackson movies, the reason I'm saying no is, first of all, with a series, you've got a lot more you can pace. So you don't have to fit everything in three movies, even if they are three hours long. Um, the other side of it is, you know, I think I'm not sure what the rights were that uh, New Line had and, and all that from Tolkien Estate, but it sounds like they weren't as restricted in the storytelling, meaning Peter Jackson wasn't as restricted in his storytelling as they're doing here. So for me, it's going to be, do I think it's like Peter Jackson's? I think it's going to be more straight to the book, you know, more straight to the stories that are in uh, Lost Tales and Silmarillion and the appendix and all that. But I think the visual, yeah, I think visual is going to stay uh, within the continuity of the of the movies because they didn't stray from in The Hobbit. They went through all the movies there, so that's my own personal opinion on it. I hope I hope I'm right because they did some good jobs on that. Yeah, stuff. it was it was strike. They were striking, and I think that I'm sure the sets, many of the sets, are probably still there. So I they, I think they they're going to utilize whatever they have and then supplement it. But I do think that the same visual style is going to be the same. Story wise, it yeah. I mean that that visual s sort of fantasy world theme seems to be in other fantasy series as well. Just looking at the Wheel of Time trailer, there is a sort of mm -hmm. approach that's gone into these high fantasy. Um, it's very you know it's hard to imagine them not doing it in a in a strange kind of way um, if they've got the budget. Um, another question we've been asked is well, or, or wants us to think about. Jake's asked us to talk about. Kelly Brimbor's uh, involvement in the Rings of Power, uh, which you mentioned a little bit, Paula, Sauron and the Nine Lords who became Black Riders. And Nancy uh, also asked about this because she points out um, the Nazgul, the Black Riders, that three of them are Lords of Numenor and the One rest for sure are... Is the Witch King. The Witch yeah, King so of you've got is both... Numenorian. Yeah, so... Obviously, Numenor disappears <laughs> in the Second Age. So these characters um, are going to be potential lesser bad guys, uh, the, the closest followers, one assumes, of the Tempter Sauron. Um, so does anybody have anything they'd like to say about that sort of what they would do with... Nine is a lot of characters, but what would you do with mm -hmm. nine potentially evil lords? I think Ty has an answer for this. Okay, Ty, off you go. So, remember, they're not wraiths yet. And that's the thing that I think is fantastic, is that they're, they're described in the books, and I'm paraphrasing, so if the geeks hear this, I'm sorry, but they're described as great sorcerers. And to me, that's freaking, that, that's going to be pretty cool. Because, you know, the Asari doesn't come, they don't come out till the, in other words, Gandalf, Sauron, Radagast, the, the two blues, they don't come out until the Third Age. So you've got this time to build those characters out and, uh, you know, watch them slowly evolve into the emissaries of Sauron. And to me, that's going to be incredible. But it's also the balance of having the dwarves with their rings as well. And eventually, like what we were talking about, everything starts falling apart. So, you know, in one side, you've got the rings of power being built. On the other side, you've got Numenor. And to see the the rings of power start to just, you know, bring the downfall of these guys is going to be pretty cool. And if they're not all, now, that's going to be pretty late in the, yeah, late in the age. And but, some of yeah. them are Easterlings. Some of them, <coughs> excuse me, the second in command of the Witch King has been described as an Easterling. I forget what his yes. name was. He's the only other one named. He's Kahamul or something. And so he's not from Kahamul. the direct line of people. So he. Sauron reached out 
Oh, yeah. He reached out. He wasn't just concentrating on the people beneath the Numenorians in Middle Earth. He was reaching out to others. And that brings in a whole need to, group of other people. Just to, as a little sort of sidebar here, we've also had questions about the wizards, and particularly the blue wizards, who um, are the ones that Gandalf says he can't remember their names. Um, they don't come over, as Ty just said, and, or at least we think they don't come over until... They, the beginning yeah. of the third age but i mean clearly that they are like archangels they are sort of these maya figures so um, one could possibly say they were around but i don't think the tolkien estate would allow well, that there is a maya in my yeah in, no but the million yeah they there are some yes here. they exist they exist but the actual wizard version of this um are not players yet they're third age characters which is interesting because when you think about it, you've got Theonor, who devised the Silmarillions. He was a student of Aule. You have Sauron, who before he fell, was also a disciple of Aule. And then you have, you know, who raised up Numenor, who established Numenor, was Ose, who was the basically a, a Maya guy. Um, lift it up, but it was, again, Aule did that. And then all, all, basically Aule is responsible for all the problems of the elves and men, really, when okay. you get down to it. I agree. I think that's a real yeah. revelation. Aule did it. Yeah. It's all his, <laughs> yeah. It's all that's the answer to the mystery. <laughs> yeah. it's all his. So there you go. There you go. It's all his. So here's, the a, end. here's a couple of quick fire things just to wrap up here. Um, if if you were rung up and, and they said, hey, we got problems with the script, would you like to come over and fix it? Would you take that gig? Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. No question. I if imagine were, they need yeah. a ticket. I'm on my way. I'll bring my cat. You know. oh. <laughs> the, the the writer's room must be full of people banging their head against the wall, though, just oh, trying to square I this up. I couldn't circle. even imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's hard enough doing a Hallmark script. I can't imagine doing the entire silver hill. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I tend to little plug there. I've got a yeah. lot of um, beer from Brie. So... <laughs> Really? I mean, you think about Lord of the Rings, that that's a narrative and it still took them. I don't even know how many times they went through it. Now you've got something that's going to encompass 4,000 years. Wow. You know? And, yeah. And I still I keep mean, wondering, how is that going to be structured? That's the thing that really is yeah. fascinating me is how are they going to structure it? How are they going to bring the continuity? How are they going to, how are they going to inter interweave all of these stories? You got yeah, absolutely. Mortal elves versus mortal men, like you said, mayflies. Yeah. So the next quick fire question is the other side of the camera. Um, if you were going to be cast as a character, who would you pick? I'm just going to say that there is a cast list um, of headshots of, on the Amazon Prime site. And it's quite a fun mm -hmm. game, which I did with my boys, which is to go through trying to guess who everybody was going to be, you know, elf, dwarf man Numenorean you know it's quite fun to see if you can guess um looking at it the one face I recognize who's really famous in the UK is Lenny Henry who's a really well-known actor comedian over here very very like Sir Henry Sir Lenny Henry is one of our acting nobility over here um can't work out who he is hmm. absolutely fascinating Elros he would be you know He's, he's he can't he can't have a minor role. So you look at these people, and you think, oh, who on earth can you be? Um, so that's quite fun. But let's imagine that for some reason you got the call and they decided to cast you. Who would you like to be told that you are playing? What's the meaty role? Boy, that's Tar Palantir. I don't know. That's going to be um, Tar Palantir. Is that's your a favorite. that's a real tough Northern question. Minorian yeah. Thing. I, 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 I want to be Sauron. That's the one I'd like. I was to just be thinking the, the same thing, you know, it, you because be the, the wicked charmer definitely want to be yeah. the wicked charmer. And the thing is, he's, he comes as something of beauty and then he goes in spirit and then he becomes the eye. So he's got multiple forms there. So you could, you could play with the yeah. character a bit, but boy, that's a tough question. Maybe. I don't think I'd, I'm not first on their list for that part for many, many reasons, uh, including the fact I can't act. Uh, and I'm the wrong gender, but there we go. I think that would be in in this imaginary world. That's the one. Perhaps they could put so me in one of those snow cap suits. 
Especially with <laughs> <be> female. <laughs> How do you know? Paula, what, what about you? What, do you, what, do you, what oh, would you go for? I've, I've thought about this a lot of times because every time I read something else, oh, I want to play that person. But um, I have always, this is very presumptuous of me, but I always thought I would be good as Melian. Oh, right. You fancy yourself as a Maya. Sure, why not? I think another really good female part would be um, is it Tar Muriel, the last tragic that last was the queen. other part i was thinking about is tarmuriel melian what i yeah, like no, I mean, she goes through so much too yeah it's hard so to they were, i hope all of you um who are watching this are having your own little thought experiment here of casting yourself in this and maybe some of you even are in extras or whatever and having great fun um I think it's going to be amazing i really wish the production team well on this i hope that you really succeed um, we're here to support you and stand in awe of the task that you have in front of you we wish you really well with it bless you yeah absolutely um for those of you who are watching um if you want to keep in touch with our future uh live streams do go to our website there's lots of things happening on our website including some um, fantasy writer courses and in-person courses in oxford because the whole point of the Oxford Centre for Fantasy is to remember where this writer came from, where Tolkien came from, the city that inspired him, as well as his friends, C.S. Lewis and others. So that's what we're about. Um, but it's great to see that his influence has spread all over the globe and uh, it's such fun to share it with you all. So thank you so much for staying with us and for watching. Goodbye.